Welcome, everybody. I am Rachel Garetta, and I am the Marketing Communications Director here at Johnson Bixby, and we are really excited to share our first Ripple event in video format and recorded webinar. So we are filming this today as a on-demand webinar that you can watch anytime. Um, and, you know, Ripple events are really any type of gathering. So we're kind of counting this as a true gathering of uh, people, even though it's all virtual. And um, it's, you know, a way we can share information and knowledge with our clients and our community to help them make more informed decisions. And that's exactly what we're doing here today by talking about college funding and how to um, plan for college, what your college philosophy is, and, you know, what that looks like as a major part of uh, one's life at times. So without um, more introduction, I'm going to introduce you to our speakers today. We have Kim Baker, who is one of our uh, long-term financial planners here and director of financial planning at Johnson Bixby. And we also have Zach Reuter. And uh, Zach is a um, one of our newer financial planners, but they are both equipped with um, great knowledge to share with you today. So Kim, I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Thanks so much, Rachel. So it's great to be here today, uh, even, even in a virtual platform. I wish I could see everyone in person and be able to field questions in person, uh, but that's the great thing about technology in uh, the era of a pandemic, post-pandemic, is that we can do things like this virtually. Uh, so Zach and I are two of the planners that make up Johnson Bixby's financial planning team. And Zach and I spare, share a special interest in helping families plan for college. Now, since we do hear questions from parents and grandparents all the time about how to go about funding this goal, we wanted to share our thoughts about the topic with all of you. So today's presentation, as Rachel mentioned, is being recorded Although we're sure you won't want to miss a single word, the benefit of having a recording is that listeners can skip ahead to the section they're most interested in learning about or replay a part that they want to hear again. So with that all said, let's get the show on the road. Take it away, Zach. Thanks, Kim. So, you know, when putting this thing together, we wanted to highlight a few key takeaways, things that we hope you walk away with after you, you view today's webinar. So the first and foremost being, we think it's really important when thinking about saving for college, funding college for your kid, grandkid, niece, nephew, whoever it is, uh, that you form a college funding philosophy. So why are you even going? What's the, what's the purpose of going to college? What is it, how does your family think about college or any post-secondary education, whether that's a four-year university or a two-year trade school or some other sort of uh, post-high school education? How do you think about that? Are you thinking about it before college? And we think you need to take the time to put together a philosophy. What makes sense for you, your kid or grandkid, your family, and thinking hard and having conversations before it's all of a sudden 18, 19 years old, and we're going, and we're just kind of flying by the seat of our pants. We want you to have a, a firm philosophy and understanding going into that. Secondly, uh, the numbers. So the, <laughs> the cost of college uh, uh, doesn't go down, typically, if you're paying any attention over the last few decades. So it can be a really scary number to look at those, uh, those tuition costs and all-in costs, regardless of the type of college um, or post-secondary education you're looking at. So we want you to really understand what those costs mean, how to break them down, and how you pay for those. It really is, uh, as we'll talk about later, a patchwork quilt of funding to make college a reality for a lot of um, students. So again, breaking down those tuition numbers, breaking down the all-in cost, and then all the ways you can get to reach that number and make it a reality. And finally, what are your steps? Where are you in the process today? Is your future student five years old? Are they 10, 15, 18 is college next year? Maybe they got to college later in life. Are they 25, 30 and are going back to school? Maybe it's a grad program. So where are you in the process? How do you think about your age and stage in relation to funding college? Because it's very different from a, a five-year-old to a 30-year-old. So we want to make sure you understand where you're at and what you should be focusing on at that point. So this brings us to my favorite quote about college uh, planning and, and a philosophy around college. Hope is not a strategy. 
So I hope to go to college one day uh, is not what we hope you take away from today's presentation. We want you to come with an actual strategy. So another quote, you know, uh, failing to plan is planning to fail. Um, and that kind of goes across the spectrum uh, in financial planning, but college funding in particular. So hope is not a strategy. If you walk away with a quote today, I hope it's that one. So why does planning for college matter? Why can't we just figure it out as we go? Why can't we just play it by ear? I'm putting some money away here or there. Isn't that enough? Or I have family members that are going to step up and help me. And no, we haven't really talked about it, but I just think it'll work out. Um, uh, newsflash, that's that's not the best. We don't think that's the best way to go about it. So we think it is important to plan. Uh, that's, that's our business. And here's why. So take a look at this graph here. This is one of my favorite graphs uh, about paying for college. Is going back to the 70s, you look at what college costs then, and then how inflation, broader inflation in the US, has been far outpaced by the rate of inflation in college and uh, post-secondary education. So just, I mean, just look at the look at those numbers. You look at especially those those private college numbers are especially stark, where if the cost of private education, a private college um, had merely kept pace with inflation you're looking at a tuition bill of about $20,000 a year. Um, in reality, it's closer to 50,000 plus today. It's just the, the rate that um, college, the expense of college has gone up has far exceeded regular inflation. And you can look, take a look here at the, the public college numbers too, where those are you know, uh, uh, at 20 to $25,000 today, when if they had simply kept pace with uh, the same inflation that all the other things uh, that go up and down are, um, you'd be looking at closer to 10. So we this is a really big line item for people. Uh, you would not not have a plan for anything else that's going to cost you, uh, you know, six figures to go through potentially. So why would you not have a plan for college? So we're going to help you get to there. These Again, these numbers are, are scary to digest and we're going to break them down, but it is a, a somewhat stark reality to if you're going to look at the all-in cost of college today. We just want to help you be prepared. And Kim, with that, I'll let Kim uh, take it away on uh, diving a little deeper into what does it mean to have a college philosophy? Sure. So let's talk for a minute about the concept of a family college funding philosophy. For a lot of people, that might not be anything that you've ever given any thought to about at all. But after dealing with clients for many years, we can tell you no two household philosophies around college funding are exactly the same. It can run the gamut from we will pay 100% of any college our child is accepted into, uh, no, and, and we will sacrifice our own uh, retirement goals or um, we, we will do whatever it takes. We'll take a second job, what, whatever it might be, uh, into um, we feel really strongly that our child must pay their own way. That's what I had to do, and that's what I'm expecting that they will have to do as well. And there's a wide variety of combinations in between. So that's what we mean when, we're, when we talk about your, your family's college funding philosophy. Now, here are some things that we recommend families take into consideration as they develop their own college funding philosophy. The first thing is, what exactly is it that this student is seeking from attending college? Are they most interested in pursuing a particular field of study so that they can get a degree, so that they can get a particular job when they are done with their school? Are they mainly interested in the experience of going to college and all of the interesting things that go along with being a college student? Are they looking to build network and connections that will assist them in being able to further their career aspirations in some way? Or is there some combination of these factors that is important to the particular student? And so it's going to be a different mix for every student and for every family. So those are, those are some of the things to be thinking about. What's the student really looking for in going to college in the first place? Secondly, ask the question, are they looking at schools that are a good fit from a personal, academic, and financial fit? 
And from a personal fit, it needs to it needs to feel like a comfortable place for them to go. Uh, is it is it far enough away from home or close enough to home for them to be able to um, you know get back to the familiar, or do they want to get completely away from the familiar? Um, is it academically very rigorous, or is it uh, you know a little bit of a, an easier entryway into uh, separating from high school learning and going into more of a, a college type curriculum. And then lastly, is it a good financial fit for the, for your child to think about going to that particular college? Is it something that you can afford to do? Um, one saying that we that we like from a, a college expert that Zach and I listen to quite a bit, um, he has a saying that if you if you try to pick the school that you're going to attend before you know how to pay for it, it's like letting a 16 year old pick out a Ferrari as their first car that they're going to drive. And most folks would say, "There's no way that that's going to be the car that I'm going to let my 16 year old decide on. They're going to get you know a nice nice safe car with lots of airbags and plenty of steel, <laughs> very and affordable. And maybe it's a little bit of a, a of a junker, maybe." You know, because you know some things are going to happen. So that's the second point. The third part of a college funding philosophy that we take a look at is really what can you afford to pay out of pocket? And this comes down to just like you do for other aspects of your life, doing a bit of a uh, budget and thinking about what, what are you going to be able to uh, afford to do that won't impact other goals that you're trying to plan for right now. So we don't want you to necessarily have to give up all your vacations in order to afford a certain college for your child or um, have to work 10 extra years in order to afford a certain college for your child, unless that's something that you really want to do. If that's part of your college funding philosophy, fine, but really look at what can you afford to pay out of pocket is important. Um, it will, this will take aid and grants and scholarships in, in account into looking at the whole picture too, when you're, when you're thinking about what can we really afford. And so we'll look at that some more as we get into um, some of the part of the discussion later about how to fund the college. The last aspect to take a look at is what responsibility does the student have in all of this planning? Uh, are, is there an expectation that the student is going to be on the hook for at least some of the cost or half of the cost or even all of the cost in some way? Uh, will there be a requirement that they work during school or is it more important for you, for the student to just get good grades? That's their, that's their only job is to get good grades and you don't expect or parents don't expect any outside work to happen at all. Uh, is there a res responsibility uh, for them to kind of gradually get into a full college experience, maybe starting at a community college and work their way into a four-year university after getting their feet wet with college for a year or two locally? So that's the other the other piece. You know, what is the the student's responsibility in the college funding? So once all of these aspects have been really thought through and a philosophy developed, be sure to communicate those expectations to the student before the college search begins in earnest. Because really everyone, the student, the parents, the grandparents, everyone involved in helping make this college dream a reality should be on the same page. And there shouldn't be any late surprises in the college funding game. Uh, the, the student should have some, some new um, expectations sprung on them kind of, you know, late in the process as, as a senior uh, is not the right time for, for someone to find out for the first time that um, they, they, they can't afford to go to Harvard, for example. We really want to discourage saying the most dangerous seven words in college planning. And those are, if you get in, we'll figure it out. That does not sound like planning. Hope is not a plan. <laughs> uh, 
All right. So now what? So now what, Zach? Well, now we're going to touch on, okay, so we've discussed philosophy. We discussed the importance of um, talking as a family or talking in whatever your family unit looks like about how to uh, how to approach college and what's the expectation on all sides, parents, grandparents, other family, the student themselves, et cetera. And now we got to figure out, okay, how do we afford it? What can we afford? Um, and that's what we'll dive in here. So first step, again, reference this earlier, assess where you are in the timeline. It's a very different to start the college planning process at early in life. You know, I have two young kids myself and I was very eager given my line of work to open a 529 as soon as I could for my youngest daughter when she was born. And it's a different, and you know, I was lucky enough to have the knowledge. My parents helped instill some of that knowledge in me. I'm in an environment that actively talks about this all the time. So I'm at a bit of a leg up uh, as opposed to kind of the general population here, but I started very early on this. And so my planning looks very different today uh, with kids, you know, under five, as opposed to someone who really trying, trying to get their stuff together when their kids in middle school or even in high school. So where are you in the timeline? It looks very different between a three-year-old like I have and a 13-year-old where, okay, we're only five years out, hypothetically, from, from post-secondary education. How does that planning differ? So understand where you are in the timeline. And having multiple kids or having or being a grandparent and funding a, a grandchild's uh, uh, education is different. So you, there's multiple timelines. The more kids you add and the more, more um, expectation of college there is, then uh, the planning preferably starts earlier. But again, it is never too late to start. So first step, assess where you are in the timeline. So what a, a great um, way to think about funding college is to start backwards. So again, this is the same person who had the Ferrari quote is the is the one where uh, um, I kind of learned this from. And and that's that, you know, you get that, you, you look at the cost of college and, and colleges do a great job of, of um, when you log on and you're looking at specific schools or just trying to get some ideas of schools in your area, what they cost. They have, you know, estimated cost of attendance pages or calculators you can get on there and very quickly put in basic information about you and your family and your income and get a, a decent idea of what that cost is going to be. And they also sometimes do a good job of estimating what kind of aid you'll get as well. So starting at the end, so let's say this, the school I want is uh, you know, kind of an all-in cost of, of $30,000. Okay, how do I get to that $30,000 each year if it's a traditional four-year school or if it's less because we're starting a community college or a trade school? Let's start with, I need, to, I need to be prepared to pay X dollars and then work back from there. How do I get to that number? Uh, and break it down. Again, patchwork quilt, we'll talk about it later, but there's lots of ways to get to that number. And consider all the funding sources. Again, patchwork quilt, there's going to be a lot of ways we're going to show you uh, to break down that total cost of college number into bite-sized chunks, where some of it's going to be grants, scholarships, things like that. Some of it's going to be family. Maybe you've got aunts, uncles, grandparents who are ready, willing, and able to support at, at some level, right? It's a couple hundred dollars, or maybe it's a lot more that they're willing to throw in. You've got what you're able to contribute as the primary guardian or parent of the student. Uh, what is the student going to throw in, like Kim talked about? What kind of skin do they have in the game? Um, what tax credits are available? So we're, we're going to go over all those things, but there's a lot of different angles from which to approach it. So don't just think, oh, $30,000, I got to find a way to pay that out of pocket, or I got a way to, I have to save up $120,000 so I can pay from my 529 or my savings account for four years. Um, it's not, it, it doesn't have to be that difficult. There's, uh, there's a lot of ways to approach it. And so taking a step back, thinking about all different ways we can get there. And then lastly, enact the plan. So you've assessed where you are, you've looked at the cost and kind of worked your way backwards. You've assessed all the different ways that you can get to that uh, tuition bill number and, and making sure that you can afford it. So let's move forward, let's get the plan going. And whether you're working with an advisor or you're just working on your own, um, let's get started. Let's move that plan forward, make sure you're on the right, uh, on the right step and in the right place. So when we're assessing the timeline here, we wanna kind of break it down into different age groups. So we're gonna start with ages zero to 14 here. So this is kind of a timeline, a traditional college student, right? Is, a, is a, you kind of go into 18, 19. So this is kind of those first formative years from birth up until high school. So hopefully you, you, this, the primary focus here is just saving. You know, what can you afford to put away? Um, you know, ideally, uh, 
as you age, your income goes up in whatever professional career you're in. So the amount you're able to save potentially goes up as well. But just starting, you know, I started those 529 contributions as early as I could, and they're not a ton per month, let me tell you, but they're a start. Um, and I know that those earliest dollars work the hardest, especially if you're investing and you're comfortable in the world of investing. You know, 529s are a great way uh, to get introduced to investing uh, without a lot of the nuance and having to know every single thing about stocks and bonds. Or if you're just very risk averse and it's just a savings account for you, that's a start too. You know, you're you're competing with inflation and some other factors there. But if that's what your start looks like, that's okay. So just getting started, uh, making it automatic. You know, I have I have the X dollars come out every month and they go to the 529 plan and I don't think about it. And for a lot of people that tends to work well because money they don't see, they don't really worry about. So think about your budget, think where you are and really those earliest dollars work the hardest, especially if they're invested. Um, compounding is a is the eighth wonder of the world, and um, you know it, it's it's important to start as early as you can. It's just like retirement saving. So next up, next bracket here, fourteen to sixteen. So again, it's the first couple of years of high school. Now we're really starting to think about college. College is on the horizon here. So how much have you been able to save? So uh, let's say we've built up our savings to ten thousand. Maybe we built up to fifty. Maybe we've had a lot of help, and it's even higher than that. Um, just assessing, okay, what are my savings at now? I start. I should have a good idea now of kind of the educational bent of my kid, of my student, um, or whoever I'm sponsoring to get to college. So I should have an idea of, okay, are they Ivy League bound? Are they trade school bound? Maybe they, maybe they're going to take a gap year after high school and kind of figure some things out. So I've got even more time to save. So you should start to have a good understanding of your individual kid. And really, this whole process is it should be individualized. There's no perfect answer for everyone. Um, but again, we're reassessing, we're rebalancing here, resetting ourselves. Kids are becoming who they are in high, in high school, but that changes all the time. I'm sure any parents out there uh, will know that you know, your kid as a freshman is very different than your kid as a junior and senior. So next up, 17, 18. Okay, we're really in crunch time now. So now it's that really more thorough planning. Okay, if college is in next year or the year after that, I have a pretty good idea of what um, the kind of the top schools that my kid is interested in what are those going to cost? Are they uh, a local public school in state so I can get, uh, you know, a decent deal on tuition? Or are they thinking big, you know, they're going to go to a big out-of-state institution, right? UCLA, University of Michigan, um, something like that. Or are they going to be Yale, Harvard, Penn? Uh, so those those require different amounts of planning and saving. But now I say, okay, now I know that I know that $70,000 Harvard bill or whatever it is in the future, I know that that number is, so I can start working backward and, and putting together my quilt and figure out how I'm going to pay for it. But it really doesn't stop at 17 or 18 either. So now we're in, you know, again, this is kind of a traditional student here. They're in school from 18 to 22, 19 to 22. Am I done? Am I good to go? I put in all the work. I put in the time. Okay, can I be done now? Uh, no, unfortunately, that's that's not how it goes. Um, you know, maybe you've got the next, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or something, and they've dropped out, and they you don't need to fund anymore, and they've already built a billion dollar company. Uh, but if not, then you know the planning continues. You know, my planning, you know, just speaking from personal experience, uh, my my situation changed throughout college. You know, I had a, a I worked on campus by the time I was a junior, and had most of my housing covered from the job I had. So that was able to, you know, able to redirect savings um, and tuition money to different places then. And to my brother, too, who was just starting school when I was a junior. We, we ended up going to the same college. Uh, so that's a, that was a big bill at the same time for my parents. So reassessing each year, see what resources are available. Does my scholarship continue? Does my grant money continue? Um, it really is a year by year thing until you get until you get through it. Um, is my kid going to need a fifth year? My brother-in-law took six because he was an engineering student and a football player <laughs> with internship requirements. So that was a long term. That was a long term commitment for my for my in-laws um, and making that work and making sure he understood what that meant for him and his trajectory. And really, throughout the entire time, age appropriate communication. You don't need to talk to your five year old about tax credits. But you you do need to talk to um, your 18 year old potentially about it so they understand, OK, we've got X dollars covered just because of the way our tax system works. And even if they don't know the ins and outs, they know, OK, the, the, that part of my plan is covered. Maybe I should um, uh, focus on scholarship X, Y, Z instead to help bridge the gap that we need to get to that final number. So tether or tailor your conversation to to where your your student is at throughout the process. 
All right, let's get into some of the nuts and bolts of estimating the cost. Uh, if it's been a while since you've been in college, uh, you might be a little rusty on what some of the current figures are. And I just want to set the table a little bit before we get into some of the details around the current costs of college and how we put together a, a, a game plan for funding that college cost. So as we've already mentioned a few times before, paying for college really is one of the largest expenses you'll ever face. Just how large is it? Well, here's a look at what it would cost to fully fund three different college scenarios for a student starting in the fall of 2023. So when we're looking at total cost of college, we are looking at tuition, which is the cost that, the, that is paid to the school just for the privilege of attending there. On top of that, you've got uh, books and supplies, You've got room and board if you're living on campus or even if you're living off campus. The only time that you don't necessarily have room and board is if you're able to commute from home. And then there's all the miscellaneous expenses associated with college too. And that can be everything from parking passes to transportation to and from school. What if your student um, is, is attending school several states away? And you know they come home for some of the major holidays where you go out to see them periodically. And then there's the on-campus activities that they might be involved in. So there's always gonna be some miscellaneous component as well. So here we're going to look at some college costs, assuming starting in fall of 23, we also are going to assume that college continues to go up in costs at a rate of about four and a half percent per year. We're going to assume in all of these scenarios that the student is an in-state resident. So we're not paying out-of-state fees for any of these comparisons. And we'll also assume, just to try to keep things on as much of an even playing field as possible, that this is paying 100% of the cost out of your own pocket. What would it cost to go to uh, school in various settings? So we're going to start with one of my alma maters, home of the fighting penguins, Clark College, which is a two-year junior college located here in Vancouver, Washington. So if uh, a student was looking at attending Clark College in fall of 2023, uh, you can pull this information right off of Clark College's own website. They will give some estimate of their expected costs. Um, Current annual tuition at a junior college like Clark is running $4,530 a year. And that would be just the tuition for a full-time student who is living at home. Now, the total cost that they estimate on Clark's website would be 16698 and when I saw this figure, I said, what? That cannot be possible. Uh, my brain said, I know I paid nowhere close to that kind of a cost when I went to Clark. But that is their estimate of what it would cost to attend for a full year at a junior college, including the books, the supplies, and transportation room and board. So if you don't have the benefit of being able to live with parents and be able to commute to school, uh, you know, total cost for having a small uh, studio apartment somewhere close to campus or share, you know, doing a house share with some multiple roommates would be close to $17,000 a year. So even if we strip out the room and board cost and just add back in the books and supplies and the transportation, they are still estimating uh, the cost to be about Eighty-seven fifty-four per year, so you know, pretty expensive when you include, you know, the transportation, the parking, uh, some of the miscellaneous fees, and such. So Clark is a two-year school, and so to pursue a two-year degree at Clark, the estimated total cost for a two-year degree at Clark runs thirty-five thousand six eighty-four to complete your associate's degree. That's a little shocking. 
Everyone needs to take a breath here. Just calm down. Um, imagine this. Five years from now, assuming about a 4.5% rate of inflation, the total cost to attend Clark for two years starting in 2028 would be about 44,469. Gulp. <laughs> But wait, there's more <laughs> because not everybody will go to a two year college. A lot of uh, folks are looking at in state schools. And so we wanted to do a comparison using an in state school as well. So we have no allegiance to any particular university in Washington state, but we decided to just pick WSU, the Cougars. I, I, I have no care whatsoever whether you're a cougar or a husky or Viking or something else. So this is just a comparison. Uh, Washington State University, starting in 2023, the annual tuition, just tuition, expected to be 11,841. And the all in cost for an in state student would be about $28,000 for one year of school starting pretty soon, just next fall. Multiply that $28,000 a year estimated cost times four years, assuming student gets done in four years. There's, there's a, another wild card that works into the mix too, is whether the student can actually complete in just four years or needs a fifth, or maybe even as Zach said, a sixth year. But four years of school at Washington State, completing in, in as a uh, in-state resident, would run you about 125,140. And five years from now, with a four and a half percent rate of inflation added to that, your total cost for four years of school at Washington State would run about 155,947. For an out of state tuition cost, you could pretty much uh, take that annual tuition and raise it from 11,841 up to about 27,000. It would more than double just for tuition. And then you would have all of the other extraneous expenses on top of that. So that's examples for an in-state two-year college and an in-state public university. But there are people who are looking at private universities too. And since I'm speaking today with someone who has attended a private university, I thought he might want to share some of those details from his own personal experience. <laughs> yeah, if these, um, if these numbers weren't shocking enough for you, we, we wanted to up the ante a bit here. And so my my alma mater here, Gonzaga University over in Spokane, Washington, which was the perfect mix of in-state, but far enough from my home that I could, uh, I felt like I was far away. Um, Gonzaga is our next, our next case, test case here. And so if you're looking at Gonzaga tuition next year, uh, you're looking at $49,800 tuition alone. So a bit, a bit higher than we've seen thus far. Uh, but continuing on annual total costs, so all those same considerations we talked about before, uh, fee, extra fees, supplies, transportation, room and board, et cetera, they, all, they estimate that at just under six, at just under 70,000, 69,795. So if you were to finish Gonzaga in four years, and I know plenty of people that didn't, uh, <laughs> you're looking at a bill, you know, factoring in that it does inflate each year that you're there. Uh, a total bill of 312000 which will get you a home, maybe not in the Northwest anymore, but several places throughout the United States, you can buy a nice home for that amount. And let's say we got to wait five years. Our kid is still just finishing up middle school. They got to go through high school, but they're dead set on Gonzaga. They saw enough basketball games on TV that they're committed. That is going to run you about 388850 So... Now, if you, if you if you gulp to four, feel free to double or triple gulp here <laughs> as needed. But we're really gonna we're really gonna break this down for you. What is that? What do those numbers mean? And what am I actually gonna pay? Because we don't want you looking like this, <laughs> which 
is what I'm sure my folks dealt with when I told them that GU felt like the right fit for me. So true cost of college. That's what we're about here. Net cost. So we talked about all that. Again, I keep going back to this patchwork quilt, which I promise we'll get to eventually mm -hmm. in this presentation. But there's a lot of different ways to get to um, to get to that final bill, to get to be able to afford the school that you and your family have planned around appropriately. And it's about that net cost. So you see those sticker prices of even, you know, Clark, maybe that 4,000 plus is a stretch in your mind. How am I going to afford that for this year of school, let alone the, the Gonzaga number of, you know, 40 or 50 grand? Um, it's about net cost because there are so few people, if any, really, that are paying that precise amount, especially as you go up uh, the ladder of, of expenses. The more expensive the school, it's usually true, the more um, potential aid, scholarships, et cetera, there are. Not in all cases, but sometimes it's very rare that you're going to be paying that number that we showed you for those institutions or wherever your, your student chooses to go. We're really about net cost. So we want to give you, uh, you know, something to kind of lower your blood pressure here and see, <laughs> you know, sticker price versus net price. What can I expect at public and private colleges here? So average sticker price here, public university, 26.8. And these are kind of more national numbers, not, not just Washington-centric uh, Washington as we've been so far. But the average net price, you go down to 19. So again, it's not free. You're not getting down to zero here. But that's a pretty, you know, seven thousand dollars is not nothing. That can be that can be a make or break for a lot of families in terms of their college planning. The average grant aid per student at a public college nationwide is eighty one hundred dollars, and that's that's pretty that that's um that's money you know granted by the institution themselves from from whatever resources they have available to students. So you know. If you, you shave off those numbers and they're going to vary based on the type of school you're going to go to, it's a meaningful difference in the price of the school. So moving on to private, again, this is more in the Gonzaga range. The average private university is going to run you just under 55000 sticker price. When we get down to net price, whoa, big jump there. So that, that's a $20,000 difference there in what folks are actually paying because of all of these things we talked about, grant aid in particular being the primary one they're highlighting here. Average grant aid per student at a private college, $23,000. So those are um, scholarships, merit aid, et cetera, things offered by the institution to incoming students. So, you know, those numbers seem big and still the net prices might seem big to you too, but they are much uh, easier to swallow than those sticker prices. So how and where to save? Kim, get us to that quilt. <laughs> We've built up a lot of anticipation for the quilt now, haven't we? So we tell clients that smart planning for college works a little bit like a patchwork quilt with a little bit of the total cost coming from multiple sources. So to start with, students can start earning credits toward a college degree in high school. I have many clients with kids who have taken some courses at a local junior college through a running start program and earned some college credit that way at a cost of practically nothing. Uh, you can also, if you, your student is academically inclined, take uh, advanced placement classes in high school and uh, test out for college to receive college credit. So you can uh, receive some, some AP credits in high school. And there's also a number of opportunities more and more all the time to take college courses in high school at colleges and, and it's college level work. But again, it's gonna be for the more academically inclined kids who would pursue those kinds of things. So three of the patches in the patchwork quilt just can come as, as soon as in high school. And these are very low cost ways for a student to start earning credit for college. Another thing that we recommend whenever possible is for clients to take advantage of any available tax credits because those tax credits can reduce their actual out of pocket costs. There are a number of tax credits that have been unveiled over the past decade or so 
they have different earnings limitations. They have um, different rules around how much you have to pay out of cash flow or out of pocket in order to receive a maximum credit. There are some credits that are only good for four years and some credits that are good after those first four years for, a, you know, for an unlimited number of years beyond that. And so this is something that we take into account when we do tax planning work with clients is to see, are you eligible for any tax credits and how can we, how can we get some of those for you? Uh, it can be an important component for doing the college funding um, planning. Another area that contributes to the quilt is that uh, many parents and grandparents actively save in some type of savings vehicle, such as a 529 college savings plan or an educational savings account or Coverdell account, maybe a Roth IRA or uh, a, a, an UTMA account in the child's own name or even in just a regular taxable investment account. Um, all of these different funding vehicles do have benefits and drawbacks. It all depends on what's important regarding the operational flexibility, um, the tax efficiency, and the effect on financial aid. So they're all pieces that we work through and talk about as we're putting a funding plan together. So we need to take a look too, besides savings vehicles, we need to be looking at cash flow. What's the available cash flow that you could continue to chip in toward that college bill even after high school graduation has happened and college has already begun. Likely there's going to be some ongoing need to continue to pay some amount of monthly contribution toward those college costs even after college starts. And then the last couple pieces of the quilt are things that most folks are already familiar with. And those are scholarships, loans, grants, um, other, other aid like that, that you uh, may access through application uh, for a scholarship or application using the uh, federal financial aid application, the FAFSA. Um, these are other ways that you can help pay for college too. They may involve more upfront work, but they can be renewable. They oftentimes offer flexible payment terms if it's a loan that needs to be repaid. It may even be forgivable in some cases, depending on what type of loan it is or what type of career the student eventually pursues. So in the end, the patchwork quilt looks something like this picture with a little bit of the cost coming from multiple places. So now you might, you might ask yourself, Kim and Zach have talked about a lot of things. How do we put it all together? I'm confused. What do I do? What, what, how do I think about this? What do I do first? Well, if you've uh, uh, dozed off throughout our presentation here and want to start fresh, we're going to walk you through a, um, a scenario here. So kind of putting all the pieces we talked about together, what does that look like uh, for a, a hypothetical student here? How do we get them from A to Z? So. We put together a case study. So meet Penny Weiss. She is our student here. She's the one that's going to college, but we've done work ahead of time. Penny and her family have planned for this. This is not all of a sudden Penny graduating from high school and saying, mom, dad, whoever, I wanna go here and I wanna do it next fall. There's been lots of discussions beforehand. So just some background on Penny here, she's 18. So she is preparing for college. Um, she is graduating from high school. She's the oldest in a family of five. So two, uh, two parents, three, two, uh, two siblings, and then Penny's the oldest here. And college is the culture, meaning they've talked about this. They have a family philosophy. They value education um, in this home. They, uh, they, they don't they can't afford, you know, a, a $70,000 school or something and pay all out of pocket. They've had conversations about that. Penny's going to need to chip in a bit, whether that's through, you know, her own income that she can bring in at work or, or at school, excuse me, outside of the classroom um, 
or loans or whatever it is, but there is an expectation that she contributes, but there's also a strong expectation uh, the parents have put on themselves to be able to help her out. You know, they, do, they don't want, they can't afford to do it all on themselves, but they they can afford, they have saved in some various vehicles and do have a, a, the cash flow to help support throughout Penny's time there uh, for her traditional kind of four-year experience. And that's what they're, that's what they decide on is a good fit for her after she's looked around and assessed her options. Again, they started early. So this was not a conversation that started in high school. It started before that. It started, you know, college was talked about in elementary school. Again, age appropriate communication. It was talked about in middle school, um, you know, as it was obvious that, you know, Penny enjoyed school. She liked it. Uh, she, it was, it was important to the, the, the parents both attended and worked hard to attend and they instilled that in her and, and she, she, uh, she took to that and, and wants to pursue her own educational journey. She's also a running start student. So she got the bug early, like Kim, like Kim mentioned. She started college before she even got to college, um, was able to take some college courses. And that's another way that she's contributed to this college education is by starting early and getting some credits before she even walks on campus. And just to kind of paint a picture, uh, the gross household income here for this um, family, and this we're kind of using our, our clients and all the interactions we've had with folks saving for college, you know, they, they bring in 150,000 gross as a family. So, so two strong jobs, uh, both parents, they've both been working full time and kind of are continuing to work their way up the ladder in their respective careers. So they do have the, um, uh, you know, again, strong income and the ability to support Penny uh, ongoing as she goes there. And where is she going? Well, would you look at that? She's going to Wazoo, one of our uh, case studies from earlier. So again, we'll use um, we'll use the same numbers we referenced earlier for Washington State University to uh, to show you what it looks like for Penny in her first year there. Bring on the quilt. Okay, so again, we go back. What does Wazoo cost year one? Well, she starts next year, so it's going to be twenty seven thousand nine hundred and ninety one dollars. Ooh, that's a tough pill to swallow. But again, we've had conversations about it. We've saved in various vehicles. We know we we've talked to our advisor, Kim or, or Zach or whoever it is. We know about the tax credits available to us and our family. Um, and so how are we going to put this together? So our first step here, first part of the quilt. Again, I mentioned she's running start. So she's uh, you know, a full time student at Wazoo is 12 credits um, per semester. So she's already knocked out two classes worth. So again, three credit increments are the, cl are the classes there at Wazoo. She's, uh, she's completed six credits worth of coursework through the Running Start program. And so at an estimated $460 of credit, she's already contributed $2760 to her education thus far. And you could prorate that out over four years because maybe this means she graduates early or you, know, you can account it in different ways. But we're going to say that, hey, she gets to take two less classes in year one here. And that's how we're doing our accounting. Next up, merit aid. So again, public institutions don't typically offer as much merit aid as private ones, but because Penny's a strong student and has been for some time, Wazoo did grant her uh, 1,500 in various um, scholarships and aid that were in-house there from the financial aid office. And when I ran the net, the, the calculator for Penny and her hypothetical family, they average, they, Wazoo says they average 3,000, so twice what I put here. But to be conservative and show that, okay, maybe uh, Wazoo's had a few tough years and they don't have as much uh, grant aid to offer for whatever reason. The, the legislature hasn't been as generous recently. We're going to only assume she's get 1,500 from, from the college itself here. Next up, scholarship. So Penny, outside of the uh, aid offered by Wazoo, has uh, sought out and achieved $2,000 in scholarships. Now, is this one that will renew each and every year? Well, we won't talk about that. But for year one, at least, um, she's, she's got $2,000 worth of the scholarships that she applied for, wrote essays, submitted a resume, whatever it entails, and she's earned that $2,000 towards her education. Her 529 plan. So we mentioned the parents were good savers. They've been putting this for a while. But even still, they don't have enough to pay all 27 from their 529 plan or, or even, you know, half, even 20 but they do have enough to put towards, they've budgeted, okay, we can put $10,000 a year to, for your four years, Penny, from the 529 plan because of our, our diligence and how we've saved and what a priority that's been. So a big chunk there from the 529 plan, which is which is great. And again, why we encourage folks to start early if you can, or in lieu of birthday gifts, you know, if I, uh, if it was my way, you know, all of my daughter's birthday gifts would be 10 to $50 donations to her 529 and not another stuffed animal. Um, but she does tend to enjoy the stuffed animals, but still 
the point being, um, you know, it, it, ask around for if a family are asking, what is uh, what is what does little Penny need this year? What is she into? Say college and see if you can get them to to donate. Even again, twenty five dollars uh, uh, over a long period of time, compounded, invested, uh, is going to do well. So again, all that to say, we we've got ten thousand dollars here from the Weiss family here from their five twenty nine plan for Penny. Next up, tax credits. So what Kim mentioned here, in particular, that AOTC you see there stands for the American Opportunity Tax Credit. And so that says that if your family is under a certain income limit, which uh, this uh, the Weiss family is, uh, 150 is not enough to reach the upper limits, and you spend $4,000 out of pocket for your, uh, your student's education, we will credit you with $2,500 back on your tax return. So you'll see here shortly that the, the Weisses do indeed pay $4,000 out of pocket ongoing cash flow for Penny's education. So they know they're going to get that $2,500 credit back. So again, that's why I just said the parents' cash flow. Again, they have, they, they have a strong budget at home. They've, they've accounted for this. Even with their two other kids, they say, hey, we can afford to do an extra $4,000 out of our ongoing budgeting and cash flow towards Penny's first year at Wazoo. And also, the, again, the, the importance of education goes up the generations here. The grandparents uh, wanted to contribute as well. Um, you know, I was very fortunate to have grandparents that valued education. They helped me with some of that Gonzaga cost. And really, you just taking a step back, my own education, um, Gonzaga, after all the aid, after the net cost, uh, factoring all the um, scholarships and merit aid and things I was able to get, was cheaper for me than Western Washington University, which was my second choice as a school. So that's to say that again, sticker shock. You know, take a step back. What is my net cost going to be here? What can my what can my kid and family provide that'll get into that net cost number? So our grandparents here, are very generous, have offered up two thousand a year uh, to help Penny with with her freshman year here at Washington State. And last but not least, again, more skin in the game for Penny. She's decided to take on uh, and understands the, what a loan means long term. It's been well explained to her by her parents that this is not free money. It will be paid back one day. She's taking out a $3,500 Stafford loan, which is a, a loan offered to just about everyone who wants to go to college from the federal government. And this one is, I wrote unsub. So that's unsubsidized, which means that interest accrues from the minute she gets that loan to the minute she's done graduating and has to start paying on it after she graduates or after four years. So there's no, uh, some sometimes loans are subsidized, meaning that the government will cover the interest payments while you're in school. But in Penny's case, no, she doesn't qualify for those for whatever reason. So she's taken on that $3,500 and that feels appropriate for her given what she thinks she can do after college and what her family has planned around for her laws of education. So all that to say, when you tally all those things up, we've met the bill. So that is slightly <laughs> over the 27991 that that uh, Wazoo is pegged to cost next year. So we just really want to take this opportunity to show you that, you know, it is a patchwork quilt to fund um, a student's education. But if you break it down, it can be more manageable than you thought it was. Okay, now on to summary. You've lasted this long with us. So again, re-hitting the most important points here from our presentation. Develop that philosophy around college early. I didn't write early in there, but do it early. Have those conversations. Make it a, a, a point to talk with them, even if you're, you know, again, age appropriate all, all along the way. But it really is important to have an understanding of what do you think about college as a parent or guardian? What is your, how does your kid, what's their educational bent? And you get to see them um, as they grow up and, and how that grows and changes and develops. And, and uh, there's, there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with uh, trade school, with a two-year school before you go on to a four-year, or even just to get your associates and you decide, okay, I think I'm done with education. There's plenty of fields where that is enough. And that is um, you know, it's ever growing and changing. What you study can matter a lot more than the, the degree you have in a lot of cases and a lot of fields. So really have that strong philosophy, talk about it. Don't make it a surprise when it's come time for that college experience. And again, understand that difference. Uh, sticker price is not net price. You just saw in Penny's example, um, you know, the 27 is, is a, a shocking number, 28, whatever it was. Uh, but you broke it down and, okay, really out of pocket for us this year as a family was $4,000. Because we saved ahead of time, because we had family health, because Penny's a strong student, yada, 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 um, the, the net price is not sticker price. And it's very important to understand. And again, 
take a step back, assess where you are. Is my is my student five? Is my student 10? Is my student 18? Uh-oh, if so, but you can still do it. But really, where are you in the timeline? Break it down. What opportunities do I have at this age to save, tax plan, uh, talk with other families and friends who have been this, talk with my advisor or work with an advisor to understand what my opportunities uh, and, and limitations are. Where are you in the timeline now and plan those next steps accordingly. And really, we just want to continue uh, or encourage you to continue the conversation. Has a, has a presentation today sparked a question to you, whether you're a client of ours or not? Um, has it made you think differently about how you're funding your own students' education or plan to? Has it made you think differently about supporting or not supporting or having more conversations with the generation below you if you're a grandparent? How do I talk to my kids? I want, I want education to be important for my grandkid, but I didn't ever thought of what if they don't go or what if they go to a school that's way less than I was anticipating or way more. So we really hope it sparks some conversation, um, uh, both whether it's an internal dialogue about how you think about college for you or your student or a relative, um, or if you were the primary one planning, uh, you know, having a conversation with, with the important people in your life, uh, spouse, partner, the student themselves, your advisor, um, just really ha have the conversation and then or continue the conversation with us. If you are not a client, uh, you know, see, reach out to us and see if, if um, you know, college planning is one of the many things we do, but see if we could perhaps be a good fit for you in terms of both your college planning and greater, more comprehensive financial planning, which is our specialty. Thank you everyone for joining. We look forward to our next Ripple event webinar.